and uh, including Zoltan Isvan. And uh, your, I was been reading the uh, your kind of humanity plus FAQ and some of those comments. Okay. General, which give people a general idea mm. of yeah. what you know in a rather general way. Okay. Did you... And people take off and go, you know, apply it in different ways. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you see um, David Pierce's hedonistic imperative, um, the abolitionist project as well? Yes, I thought that would have been interesting to you because I think some of the goals are kind of similar. Uh, it's just maybe a little bit different uh, in implementation. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but like, yeah, he, yeah. So. I thought it would well, be I read some of that a while ago in terms of the emphasis on pain and suffering and hmm. the the project of trying to alleviate that through technology. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's David Pierce's uh, uh, thrust. That's what he's uh, mostly uh, trying to communicate. And I think that the, uh, the Transhumanist Association at Stanford seems uh, quite interested in his work. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's right. I've done plenty of interviews with him. I've got like a, about 20 sort of videos online with him talking or reading or doing something like that, and the, that including him giving talks at conferences and such. So yeah, he's one of my favorites. Um, yeah. So which which trans which uh, I guess philosophies within I guess the basket of transhumanism have you sort of uh, found most intriguing? Well, you know. If you look at this in terms of anarcho-primitivism and transhumanism, quite frankly, I can't get away from a rather general uh, set of problems or, or issues with it. I mean, that we could go into the details, but there could be a danger of overlooking some real fundamental things. For example, in your... I, I was just thinking again about the the general sort of comment from... Humanity Plus, let's take that. Mm -hmm. the, the idea is to improve the human condition by accelerating technological change. I mean, that would be uh, overall comment, you know, if you don't get in, you don't get specificity there, but but right away, you know, <laughs> uh, to sort that out a little bit. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, you know, as you probably know, I, I find it just the opposite. We are we are impoverishing the human condition by means of technology. It is accelerating that the pace of technological change mm. is, isn't slowing down at all. And yet, in some uh, areas it seems to, but like I think generally it is. I just, just from my point of view, I don't see transhumanism as being and uh, uh, like a, you know trying to um, progress technology without any form of discretion at all. Uh, it makes sense that we develop ethical and careful measures to implement and uh, develop developing technology in general. And I think, a, like as mentioned last time, a lot of the transhumanists have sort of moved into the area of trying to avoid risks with technology without being completely stagnant, though. Yeah, being a bit proactive well, about it. But we, you know, okay, but see, right there, we're overlooking the the elephant in the room, right, Adam? Uh, which I don't see that as a positive thing whatsoever. Hmm. Things are getting worse. I mean, I was talking to Andres at Stanford about this a little bit oh, about a month ago. Yep. We were exchanging a message or two, mm -hmm. and he was bringing up, uh, well, I think he brought up, it was either fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome, one of those, and he said, I'm just using this as an example, he said, this is something that's purely technological. And I said, really? Fatigue I, syndrome is purely technological. Yeah, I can hardly think of anything uh, that is that is isn't as social as that. I mean, it's a matter of the whole cultural uh, problematic that we're seeing in modernity. I mean, it's you can't. It's not if you get this or that pill, it's going to be fixed. Well, it could be. I don't. I don't think so. But with a lot of things. Oh, you mean soul like, through technology? Uh, I thought you well, meant cause. depression, anxiety, yeah. all these things. They, they're the estrangement has to do, in my view, with the fact of technological society. It's not. It isn't improved by more technology. It's. It's in fact made worse by more technology. I mean, that's. Uh, well, I, I can see arguments both ways. Let's, but, but, 
so you mean you think that um, all uh, mental suffering um, would be absent without technology? Well, that's hard to uh, it's hard to uh, make that stick. I mean, I I wouldn't go that far. I mean, I'm not saying that things at some distant past were absolutely perfect because we didn't have division of labor or hierarchy. But I think there are some grounds to, in terms of, well, for example, noticing, as Emile Durkheim noticed, you've got, with industrialism 200 years ago, we've got, uh, what do we have? We have more madness, we have more suicide. And he was no radical, you know, he sort of invented sociology, right, in the West. So, I mean, he, uh, well, it, we have, didn't, it wasn't we have turning a, out very well. We have a better ability to record um, these sorts of things. I think that, you know, there was suicide in the past. It, in, in fact, there has been examples. It's just that we can't record these numbers like in the past because we're not there anymore. Now that we have writing, now that we have technology to, to keep these statistics, we can then start recording this phenomenon. It's not that it never ever existed in any form right, in the right. past. It's just now we can no, record no, it and find out more about that's, it. That's a fair point. Yeah, we don't even know uh, with any kind of uh, clarity what uh, what everyday life felt like, what what uh, problems people wrestled with, or did they wrestle with? I mean, it's, it's been often said. In, in if you look at the modern literature, and this doesn't go back real far, just a few centuries, hmm. the old thing about what is the meaning of life, right? You didn't see that before the industrial revolution, right? So <laughs> that's kind of interesting. Why is that? I mean, well, I I, I, because I, I, that I is well past re records. I mean, you can find philosophers in antiquity that pondered these things. But I mean, in terms of a social kind of question or what are we doing, what, why are we here, all that sort of thing, it really did sort of uh, start with modernity, with mass society. And that's, that's pretty much inseparable from, from technology. That's what mass society is. It's mass production. And that's the basis of technology. It sounds like that could be partly explained by our ability to record, like, take censuses and record people's opinions and record people's uh, ideas. In the past, it just wasn't possible to keep individual diaries of what people thought. Um, I think some of the religions, some of the, the beliefs in animism were attempts to find meaning in the world where it was very difficult to... Uh, provide answers to all these sort of human questions. I think questioning and a search for meaning is a very human phenomenon. Well, yeah, religion is, of course, the age-old uh, response. But the the fact that there's, it seems to me, from my reading, a kind of uh, agreement or unanimity that you, I mean, it's, if religion, if religion takes care of that. Why is it that at a certain point it doesn't seem to work very well anymore? I mean, I mean, certainly religions are still around for comfort, you know, just to give answers to these questions, these kind of basic existential questions. But, you know, I think that seems to be, for whatever reasons, you can find all kinds of people who will say that it's funny that it does pop out as a big kind of social question mm. across the board only with only with modernity. Yeah, that's a, that's a well, really interesting question. I, I, I totally yeah. agree with that. Why, um, why, you know, why isn't it being, why aren't churches being used in the same way? Why isn't religions being used in the same way as they, they have in the past? You know, uh, my, my general response without really doing a lot of research is that there have been other forms of, uh, you know, satisfaction that people have been able to move on to. We have the internet. We have um, we have science. We have engineering, and people can answer their deep existential questions often by just pursuing different forms of philosophy, different forms of like a like you know what scientists tells us about the the universe and and things like that. I think that's helped people move away from answering big questions with fluff, um, without observation, but with you know um, with whatever they hope to the, the universe to to look like well you know I you know Adam we, we're just talking past each other once again I think that's completely false yeah. we, we've got <laughs> more more alienation more loneliness uh, more isolation 
not less with the internet and all these things. We, it's, uh, you know, you're putting your eggs in that basket that we have more and more and more of it. It'll be better and better, but it's getting worse and worse. I mean, people, you look at modern I, society. I, I, don't, I don't, I don't think that, you know, we're on a guaranteed like train ride to more and more and better and better. I think, you know, it, isn't that it, what transhumanism is? Well, transhumanism does believe in the in progress, but it's not, but it doesn't suggest that it's a definite progress to utopia or you know to some form of naturalized heaven. I mean, there's plenty well, of things sure that is, go wrong and have gone it wrong sure in the past. Ray Kurzweil or or Zoltan Istvan, That's exactly what it is. Um, it's sure. paradise. Even, even, even it's Ray, the singularity. Yeah, even Ray Kurzweil, it like uh, does suggests that there there's problems with uh, you know the development of AI. Uh, uh, there's recordings of him talking about how to mitigate the the risk. There's no guarantees, man. There's none. Even though like people will quote Mein Kurzweil. I'm not sure about Zoltan Istvan, but and you know he has said some pretty uh, positive things in the past about the progress of technology. It doesn't mean his whole philosophy um, is based on everything's going to be fine. Just sit back and enjoy the ride. There's stuff we need to do in order to guide the progress. I think what we do share an opinion, and I may be wrong here, is that we need to avoid a progress trap, right? Um, that that we're already currently like walking through right now. Um, I have the opinion is that we are quite lucky, <laughs> in a sense, to to have this trap not yet sort of snap and, and wipe out civilization through whether it be nuclear technology or, you know, tipping point, environmental tipping points. But my question is, what can we do now in order to avoid um, the progress trap uh, snapping shut and, and basically wiping out any potential for a valuable future? Now, you, we may disagree in our approaches to solve such a problem, but, um, yeah. Well, I think... Uh my own view is we have to get rid of the basis of it, which is ultimately domestication, which is the overwhelming ethos of control, the control that only grows and deepens uh, at every level. It just keeps growing to nanotechnology and all the rest of it. That's the fundamental basis of it. And more prosaically, it's, it's the industrial, uh, it's, it's the machine, it's, it's uh, all that... Uh, the move to uh, global industrialization. Hmm. And I think, uh, you know, it's it's easy to just take so many things for granted. For example, in the news this morning, I'm sure you've heard this, the Malaysian jet that was evidently shot down in eastern Croatia. Well, you know, I, I include that sort of thing. You've got people at 35,000 feet uh, being hit by some sophisticated rocket and you also have this going on in, in Israel, of course. Uh, you, you have, the, this is the real stuff. This is how these things are possible. For example, I think I, I could mention uh, um, the, the great, uh, the, the very interesting uh, sociologist, uh, gosh, I can't think of his name, who wrote a book about the Holocaust, pointing out that it wouldn't have been possible without industrialization. You couldn't get a, you couldn't swing it, you couldn't kill millions of people without the in industrial structure. And uh, that could be an argument in itself <laughs> to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, you know, there's plenty of examples of how people have used technology for the wrong thing. Um, I guess I'm of the opinion that technology basically can be used for good and bad, um, you know, to to really sum it up. Well, that's we, a, there's a fundamental we, difference. Yeah, Let me yeah, ask yeah. you something, Adam. So, so, do, you think, yep. do you think technology is neutral? Would you say that it's neutral? I think technology uh, has... I don't know if I'd call it neutral. I'd, I'd say that, like, the use of technology um, makes gives it a, you know, give it a purpose. We, technology in itself at the moment doesn't have its own purpose. It's kind of like saying, um, is evolution neutral? Or has the progress of from like helium to heavier elements throughout the universe, in, in the history of the universe, has that been neutral? I'd say, well, yes, there has been progress um, in a sense. Now, now it's possible for the universe to produce more complex, heavier elements. 
the and it wasn't possible closer to the big bang right now well uh, i don't know if we're confusing natural science with with what happens in society i don't know if there's okay so let me the parallel you, you, you is mentioned very technology good. and so the parallel here is that simple forms of technology um like can can uh, scaffold and produce the grounds for more complex forms of technology to to be enabled, um, but they just don't happen by themselves. Like if if right. suddenly like, like if a spear just appeared on Mars and there were nobody to use it or to to then then it would just be a spear on Mars forever. Like the, the spear wouldn't be able to uh, reproduce itself. It wouldn't be able to improve itself. It's a right. combination of technology and humans. So like yeah. with with spears and with bow and arrows, it enabled humans to more efficiently hunt, and thus um, allowing for more time and energy to be spent on other projects, including um, that would be developing more and more efficient technologies to enable survival in the ancestral environment. Okay. Well, the reason I the reason why I asked you that, if you you started out saying I believe that it, I. Correct me if I'm wrong. That the main, the main question is how we use technology, right? Mm -hmm. So that that would seem to imply that the technology itself is mainly a neutral quantum. It's if it's all in how you use it, then it's not about technology, right? Well, yes. I think the, the, if I if I'm if I was unclear, I was saying that technology doesn't make its own decisions. Right, unless unless we're thinking about artificial intelligence now or in the future, um, we're using AI oh, yeah. now for decision support systems. That's true, but what we have used technology for in the past is to optimize our lifestyle in certain ways to help us survive. Um, and animals do this to an extent too. Crows with little sticks trying to pick ants out of holes, um, you know, and, well, and bonobos do the same sort of thing with twigs, right? But they don't. Uh, they don't come along. They don't uh, continue to deepen this colonization to where it's a kind of imperialism, where the the control ethos of domestication never stops advancing down to even the atomic level. Now we start with we start with agriculture. That's what domestication is, of course. You know, domestication of animals and plants, and if you don't interrupt that the inner logic of that, and I think there is an inner logic to it. Then you you progress to where we are now. And, and the reason why I asked you if you and I guess you're not really backing away from the point of view that the main thing about technology is how it's used. I think that I mean, well, there's a fundamental difference again between us. I mean, Martin Heidegger pointed out that. Well, I won't even get into Heidegger, but what if it's not so much a question of how it's used but what it is even before we we come to the question of how we use it uh you know what what are the values and i think values come into this question about transhumanism the the contrasting values if you have tools or or very simple technology you have more of an emphasis on things like equality and intimacy and lack of uh, lack of an expertise that sets some people over others, the effective power that some people have over others by means of their specialization. You know, these are all values before you start talking about, well, we could use nuclearism for weapons or for energy or whatever. That's that's way before we get into those questions. And that's why that's that seems to be completely overlooked in the transhumanist lexicon. It seems to me. So, so let me just clarify. Do you mean um, the problem of whether technology in is, is in itself um, the causal factor in the uh, what what you see as um, a decline of like a human uh, values? Or valuable lifestyle. Wait, one second. I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt there. Yep. Go ahead, please. So, so I, I just want to clarify. What? So, where do you see? You see, technology has been the causal factor 
in um, something you don't like about current civilization? Well, what I'm saying is that you can read the technology and it tells you the nature of society. It tells you whether people are subservient to experts uh, for basic things. It tells you if they have autonomy or some equality or access to equality because if they all have roughly the same level of uh, of tools and tool use and tool creation that kind of society is going to be more of a face-to-face -face society for example instead of a mediated uh, non-face-to-face -face, which is mass society it's less face-to-face -face every moment it becomes less the individual is less accountable and responsible as technological mass society moves along step by step right well i, I don't know how, how to get how to, uh, um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. a very basic it's a very basic category or characteristic of society well, I'm and then thinking, the question I, I, of how you use society is is a secondary one so i'm not sure if i agree that like um because of we don't see each other face to face all the time. We don't like uh, interact with people as much face to face. Uh, we don't. We have more of a distributed communication system. I don't think that that has um, caused us to be less responsible or caused us to be less um, accountable, as you put it. So I think that in some ways it allows us to be more accountable because we have means of monitoring recording and and uh yeah the, what we do in society if, well that we sounds keep, good we, but do you really moving, think that people feel on... more accountable i if think people think feel so. more much more disempowered than than uh if they had some kind of face-to-face -face society i mean it's it's a uh, it's kind of hard it seems to me hard to assert otherwise it's in mass yeah, society, what, what we're you have, doing you have, we're con playing on different you have control scales. over nothing. You have control over nothing. That's why people don't much believe in voting anymore. The, 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 the amount of trust or faith or confidence or whatever in democracy is just ebbing away. Once people try it, they, they, they realize it's a sham. It doesn't, you can vote, but it doesn't do any good. It doesn't change anything. And so, I mean... Was there any form of uh, democracy, any form of voting system, any form of choice mechanism in the hierarchical structures of a, a hunter-gatherer society, you know, living next to another hunter-gatherer society? They didn't have hierarchical structures in hunter-gatherer society. Well, they did. I mean, they even have them. No, 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 no. Anthropology 1 tells you that egalitarianism is the cardinal virtue of hunter-gatherer society. Look it up. I mean, it's, it's that... It's not. I have. This I, is not I, I've looked into by this. me. I, I, look, okay. So maybe there are people out there who disagree with whether this is a fact or not. But we we know that um, our relatives, uh, apes and chimps, have a, a, a sort of hierarchical structure in the way that they sort of uh, operate in their little clans. We're not uh, apes or chimps, are we? No, but we're very closely related. We're not ants. We're we're. Uh... We're Homo. We're we're human species that uh, started yeah, they're up our about ten years ago. Genetically, um, yeah. So the great ups are, and um, look, we we've had a look through some of the ancient burial sites, and we see that some people were buried like you know, paupers, and other people were festooned in wolf's teeth and carved oh, bones geez. and Come on. jewelry Adam, and that's, all that sort that's of past, way past domestication, okay? That's not hunter-gatherer society. That was None of that existed society. in hunter-gatherer society. Yes, oh, okay, well, we'll have to disagree. It didn't. It, it simply didn't. It's not a matter of agreement. It just, it's just not true. I mean, it, it really... Well, this was before agrarian society. But, but let, me, religion, let me just say this, Adam. That's it. always... There's always an argument that there was... Roughly speaking, I'm not. I'm not really trying to put words in your mouth, but in other words, the idea, the ideological idea, there was always hierarchy, there was always alienation, there was always oppression, and that's one way to get around the question of what technology really is and what it represents. Because then you can say, well, yeah, maybe, but 
It was always that way. It wasn't always that way. Domestication changed everything. Yeah, okay. Well, you know, um, there's, let's, let's... You know, Adam, there's not one thing that we agree on. Do you think this is worthwhile here? I mean, really, I, I like you, but this is going nowhere. You, there's not one thing... And this is, I'm afraid this is going to happen with Zoltan. I mean, it's just, we're, we're <laughs> well, speaking I think, I think two vast kind of, different languages here. I think it's I interesting. It's frustrating. Try, yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah, it is. Some, sometimes disagreement, but how do we deal with disagreement to, to... It's not even disagreement. We're not, we're not, we're not accepting the same realities. I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe I'm just getting hmm. overly frustrated for no reason. But, you well, know, we can't talk about domestication apparently because oh, I, I think, think we can I think the thing oh. is uh, you know I accept that we have different views on history um, but look you know we, we in order to understand each other's points of view we need to understand not just like the fact that we disagree on one point uh, even though it may seem fundamental I think it's worth like trying to explore what what the differences really are in, like, for instance, the implications of primitivism compared to the implications of progressing with technology. Okay, yeah, you. I think you're. You strike me as a very healthy person, but you know, I, I, what I'm the way I'm looking at it is, you know, you want more and more and more technology to make this qualitative leap, this singularity kind of stuff. I want none of that. Okay, none of that. Hmm. So, so how do we really? Uh, what what is the conversation about then? You know what I mean? Well, can I ask? Is is it possible to have a primitivist society in one part of the world that operates in you know autonomously from another part of the world that decides to go technic progressive? Well, that's a good question. I I don't know. I, that could be a big uh, stumbling block because who knows whether people will be interested in going that way in the first place you know i'm not assuming that everybody's going to wake up and say oh anarcho primitivism yeah let's let's do that you know why didn't we think of that right. you know that's that may not happen at all but uh it seems to me given the the real uh negative shabbiness of, of going in the same direction we're going in now and even even stepping on the gas to really make it a technological uh, universe, then uh, it's conceivable. Yeah, but questions like you just raised there, that's a good one. I mean, I, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe, maybe people would see the example of a face-to-face -face, uh, society and say, well, gee, that sounds like uh, maybe that would work. Maybe that would be more fun than mailing in a vote and you've got millions of people and the vote makes zero difference. Hmm. Maybe not. So um, I, I'd I'd hope that we'd be able to uh, progress to a stage where, you know, we can even more uh, accept and allow for different people to live in societies in different sort of ways. Um, you know, in but that doesn't okay. Ways. I can't I can't let that one pass either. Technology doesn't permit that. It's not a matter of abstract. Well, we believe in freedom, so you can live this way and others can live that way. We know what's happening on this planet. Anybody who doesn't go along with progress is wiped out. They're being ex made extinct, right? It's not a free choice like, oh, why don't you have this banned society and, and not have any contact? No, it's, it's, it's an all-enveloping, totalizing world, and there ain't no freedom about it. So you right? believe that it's completely impossible for... Um, a primitive society to live alongside um, a technological society because well and, so and the, far yeah, so see. far and there's even less of a chance of it now and it hasn't been permitted in so far so why would it be I mean it's getting worse it's getting even un, even less likely that any of that will be allowed to to you know to uh, to exist to coexist it, it doesn't. There are efforts to, to try and maintain, um, you know, the Aboriginal culture in certain areas of Australia, regardless of the brutal history. Um, there are people working on that project now, and there has been some inroads made. What do you think about attempts to, um, I guess, keep tribes in Amazon, in the Amazon uh, forest, uh, in there, like uh, allowing them to sort of 
continue with their civilization without being disruptive and trying to like that would be a nice them. idea but the fact of the thing is the deforestation and not just in in Amazonia but you know Indonesia and so forth is just uh, is just speeding up like the rest of the whole technological thing I mean, they're not if you destroy somebody's life way destroy their habitat that's the end right and you can say well they should have freedom but if there's no basis for for their traditions and so forth that's the ball game that's the end of it yeah. and that's exactly what happens yeah unfortunately it's just been the way it's happened like uh it there are various historical accounts of these things happening you know the uh, the Amer the the Spanish coming to America and and uh, slaughtering the 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 um, the Aztecs and the Mayans. It's unfortunate, and I I'm hoping that we can learn from this from you know some of the civilization's uh, mistakes. Uh, I'm not. It's not a guarantee that we will, but I'm just hoping. Well, if we keep case, if I'm, we keep going I, down this path, there's zero chance of any of that happening. And so that's my problem with transhumanism in a nutshell. To, to keep going, even more frantically going on that very path of destruction and disrespect for, for other cultures, that's, uh, that's a guarantee that, that that's the end of that. Well, I hope not. Uh, I, I, I'm, I don't see it as being guaranteed. But let's, well, I'm let's, let's ask. Because I think there's, it's possible to put an end to the whole thing. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about <laughs> that. Let's, let's talk about how... How you, what? How would you incrementally or totally uh, remove technology from society and achieve a primitivist um, like uh, culture? I mean, w would you do it in one part of the world? Would it work just in one part of the world first, or would it work across the world? What What are the the steps to take? Well, it's. I think you know. It's. It's. We got to keep in mind that if and when people decide that this is not a healthy path, to put it mildly, then, then we get to the stage of trying to figure out, in, in reality, practically speaking, uh, how to go a different direction, how to dismantle all these projects that should have never been started up in the first place. But that's only if and when people uh, come to that conclusion that... Uh, uh, this is this has been the wrong road to go down, so let's go. Let's not. Let's just uh, stop with the technological imperative and uh, and uh, go back to a more simpler human direct kind of connection with each other that is almost disappearing now. Even despite the claims that we're more and more connected, that's that's. Uh, I think the reality is just the opposite. We're more and more disconnected with all the technology, not more connected. We can, we can, you and I can, we're, we're Skyping at this moment across continents, <laughs> but I mean, the, the real the connection is not with machines. It's, it's with, it's with people. And, and we're writing, we're, we're taking it on faith that things aren't getting, you know, more isolated and we're, that we're not more unmoored and untethered from each other, but we really are, I think. Yeah, okay. So, well, have you written or thought about any examples of possible roadmaps to, to primitivism, whether it be like, you know, an experiment somewhere in the world or, or like a global thing? Have you? Have no, you... no, I, I think that there would be a very healthy distaste for some kind of a global blueprint or something like that. I think all we have probably appropriately is is just trying to think it through and trying to approach deconditioning ourselves, de-domesticating ourselves, if you will. And you know, and you mentioned some some gatherings that you've attended. Mm -hmm. There was one two weeks ago uh, to the south of where I live, uh, it was an Earth First gathering. You, you know about Earth First. It was the Earth First Rendezvous, the the annual gathering. Okay. A few hundred people discussing these very things, and yeah. and most of them don't live on the land. Most of them don't have the money, for example, to buy land. Mm -hmm. But there are people. There are not very many, I think, but there are people that are actually 
living outside the urbanized existence that uh, that so many people have, trying to see how it could be done, how how it would be. Uh, but it's not. I I think these isolated pockets. Uh, that's that's rather limited, but you can learn certain things from doing it, I think, for sure. And then, again, it gets back to, it seems to me, it gets back to whether or not people uh, f would find that uh, a better alternative than than the ride we're on right now. Yeah, that's that's an interesting thing, because, like, if people could see, if there was, a, a, like, a, a functioning uh, primitive society somewhere in the world that people could go and live in and experience for a while um, then they'd have something more tangible more solid to be to compare to what they currently have now in in a in a technological society okay I, I think I, I totally think that there could be a lot of lessons that we current can't really describe by just like a hypothesizing about these sorts of things that could be sort of explored by trying Mm -hmm. Well, then they would be, uh, <laughs> one assumes they would be turning away from transhumanism, though, right? Well, it wouldn't yeah, matter. You I, don't, I mean, if you don't have a high-tech world, if you don't want a high-tech world, then if you were unhooking mm -hmm. from, the, from the global grid and all the rest of it, the, the industrial machine that makes it possible for it to exist, then, uh, and again, is, is that permitted? It's, it's really not... Uh, it's not really a free choice. There, there are all these free choices along the way that turn out not to be free, right, Adam? I mean, just I'm just trying to bring it down to earth a little more. For example, writing a letter to people, an actual letter, mm -hmm. <laughs> handwritten, you know, well, that's pretty much gone because everybody is emailing, right? So uh, you, you, yeah. have the, you have the abstract freedom to write a letter, but the odds every day are less than you will get a response from people that that are now hooked in totally to the whole techno thing and they don't have time they, they you know that's just old fashioned and that's gone sure what do you, what do you think about the amish i mean they they supposedly be able to write letters to each other but um they wouldn't get would, would be met with limited success in writing letters to people outside of the amish community but, right so there, there are Amish communities big enough for them to self-sustain and to have a meaningful life. Um, and they have dedicated people that go out into the world and, and look at how technology operates and some of the useful technologies they may adopt. Some of them they don't. But um, yes, so I, I'm trying to think of current mm -hmm. existing uh, social formations that are close enough to primitivism to have any useful... Uh, sort of uh, insights into how a primitive society would actually work. Well, that in fact, the uh, the Amish or Amish that has persevered indeed for quite a long time, and it, evidently the uh, the kids they make the youth leave in in order to uh, give them the chance to see whether they prefer the mainstream society, right? And and uh, apparently a lot of them. A very high percentage I've read come back. They they'd rather uh, have the community in place there in terms of. Uh, so that's interesting. Yeah, they they can do without quite a lot of technology, but it it does rest on a patriarchal religious orthodoxy that's uh, pretty strictly enforced. If they you know people want that, they stay. If they don't, then I suppose they leave. Right. Is there any other social formations that currently exist or have recently exist that are close <laughs> enough to primitivism that that, that would uh, you'd you'd be happy to live in such a, a lifestyle like that? Well, I don't know about living there. That's that's not. Sometimes that isn't uh, ours to choose. For example, I'm thinking of the connections between some anarchists and indigenous people who are who are trying to maintain or recover traditional life ways. And of course, among, for example, Native Americans, there's all kinds of choices. I mean, there are people that want to be fully modern. Uh, and there are those that some of us uh, have the honor to know who don't want that. They want to reclaim what has been largely taken away and, and defend that. And that's a project that some of us are 
uh, intensely interested in, in in supporting and being uh, in alliance with people like that. I mean, because that's a living, uh, they wouldn't use the word primitivist, I don't think, but I mean, we would see that as a kind of, for us, a learning experience and a kind of extension of what we're thinking. They're doing it. They're trying to maintain, you know, in doing it. And for example, uh, to, to, this is not a, a big uh, ongoing thing, but there are people in, in a few places in North America uh, that I know who are in league on that front and, and who feel that it's really important for the anarchist milieu to catch onto that more than we are and really, really respect that and, and see what they're talking about and what they're doing. Right, yeah. I imagine like a lot of the anarchist movement um, would be, you know, exists in different spectrums between like full-on technology adoption and full-on like a uh, technology relinquishment and primitivism. But how do you address like the, you know, the, the, the kaleidoscope of different sort of levels in between? Well, you know, the, what I'm trying to get at is that there I really do think that the conversation, this particular kind of conversation, transhumanism and anarcho-primitivism, in a certain way, and I, I don't want to push this too far, Adam, but there isn't any in between. There really isn't. You, you either go with the dominant thing that started nine or 10,000 years ago with domestication, or you are its enemy, which is anarcho-primitivism. And I'm, I'm I'm making a very sweeping, uh, you know, dogmatic statement about it, but I really think that our our points of view, as we talked about this before, are not fringe. You know, these these different approaches. It, it may sound to some, oh, transhumanism. Wow, are they kooky? What a fringe deal. Or and or, these primitivists are are quite crazy. They think we could go back and uh, reverse the whole techno uh, reality. But actually, I think, to put it crudely, that's the choice. And people who say you want something in the middle, do you get something in the middle? I don't think so. <laughs> it's, it's all sweeping in one direction. That trajectory is not made up of free choices. We see how it's gone and how it's going. And unless it stops, that's, that's the thing. You guys will win and we'll lose, to put it that way. Okay. Wow. You can say, oh, we want a nicer form of it or something, but, you know, really, I, I don't think that's in the cards. That's not the way it works. But it's the way, but I think there are examples today of people who live very close to technology and people who live very distant from technology. I think I can see plenty of uh, different sort of agreement levels with technology in society, if I can put it that way. Some people don't even use mobile phones. Some people don't, like, you know, although a diminishingly small amount, don't have uh, email addresses and such. So, so there does exist today uh, different levels of intimacy with technology. Yeah, yeah, but that's not my point. My point is the reality marches on whether I have a cell phone or not, and I don't, by the way, but I'll soon probably have to have one. Uh, <laughs> I was forced to get an email account. But I mean, the, the question is, is, look, if all of this direction, if all of this reality, I've said this before, but I think it's worth saying again, depends on the systematic destruction of the non-built world, the systematic destruction of species and other less developed people, all the rest of it, the poisoning of the air, the water, the soil, that's rampant. All of these things, the acidification of the ocean, all these things, it doesn't matter if I have a cell phone or you have a cell phone, it's irrelevant. It's just That's just a personal consumer choice that some people console themselves with. Oh, I, I don't get any paper bags at the store, therefore, therefore nothing. What, what you do or I do is one, less than one billionth of the reality that's going on. I mean, it's, that, that's silly to think that that's uh, some operative thing that, that changes the course of what's going on and has been going on for so long now. It doesn't work that way. Well, 
here's here's something that I think we agree with. I hope that we do move into a future where people can choose uh, the lifestyle or the 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 amount of technology in which they adopt. Um, whether it it's going to be the case is up for debate. We're not there yet. Um, yeah. Well, that's for sure. You are desperately trying, Adam, to <laughs> to find some agreement here. Wow, good for you. Well, I just I, mean, don't I, th see. I think there needs it doesn't have to be like a like a totalizing agreement. I think that there needs to be an understanding, a, a shared sort of you know realization of different philosophies in order to give them all justice. Okay. But um, no, it's not okay. But it is a totalizing reality, whether you like it or not, whether I like it or not. Yeah, I would agree with you. It'd be nice if we could just say, well, let's sort it out. You know, we got good stuff, and and maybe somehow we could dispense with mining, which we can't, of course, but I mean, yeah, as if we could in good faith, rationally, you and I and everybody else, but it doesn't work that way at all. It doesn't work that way, right? I mean, that's not the way it works. Well, I mean, I don't think that we have this totalizing mindset. I, I, I'm not sure whether you're attributing the totalizing factor, the inevitability of totalizing technology to the technology itself or to the people using it? Well, it's it's both, but I mean more fundamentally it is about what is the nature of technology and its logic and its movement. But, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm really not, uh, I'm not accepting as a given, as an inevitability that would just be swamped by by more and more synthetic mediation and so forth and more, no, I'm not, but that I'm only I'm, I'm not because I think it's a possibility that we will stop this. We will just stop this kind of mad uh, approach. And it's not about mindset, though. It's just, it's, it's much more basic. I don't think it's an evil mindset. I mean, if, if, if it were, then maybe we'd have an easier job of it. We could just have rational conversations. And uh, But I don't think it's so much a mindset. That would be kind of a, an, an idealist way of looking at right reality that it's just some people are whatever they are uh, just misguided or evil or whatever but it I don't think it really matters what the mindset of people is I mean that's the problem it, it goes on anyway it, it just it just proceeds and at certain points in history only at certain points in history we can see where the rubber hits the road when there is opposition for example I think of this sometimes. Back when the Industrial Revolution started in England, what, 250 years ago, the people that were making the mechanized textile machinery and so forth, that was, you know, one of the first big uh, steps forward in terms of mechanizing things. They were working on these things in workshops in secret because if, if the main population find, found out about them, they could be stoned, they would be spat upon, they would be in danger. Now we lionize these people, you know, uh, Gates and, and all these other people, uh, they, they're just heroes. So we've got a long way to go, but at times there, there have been collisions where people say, we don't want this, this movement, we want, we'd rather, for example, hang on to the handicrafts, what people can create instead of tending machines, you've got the individual imprint of, of people and their families doing things. They resisted. It was quite a battle. And of course the machine won, right? So now we got mass production. But people didn't, they didn't like it at first. Hmm. They had to be beaten. Hmm. And they were, they were defeated, right? So, but it's not, it, that's not a neutral thing. Mm -hmm. So let's just say, um, if you think that people might change their mind. I mean, in lieu of everybody changing their mind at once and saying, okay, um, let's go back to living like what it was before the agrarian civilization, in, uh, if only parts of the world decide to do that, how, can, how, how do you see it evolving? How, what, what's a contingency plan? Um, yeah, so, so if, if you're, if, okay, Plan A is to have everybody agree that technology is bad. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to uh, primitivist lifestyle. Um, if that doesn't actually work, what's the contingency plan? 
if 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 some people want to move to primitivism uh, while other people don't. Well, I, I you go back to that uh, for good reason, Adam, because that's just a heck of a tough question. I mean, I think you have to find out what's in the way of people of people being allowed to do that. You know, there's we can. I mean, that might be the starting point in itself. And, and of course, it's rather easy to see. It's less easy to get rid of the roadblocks, if you will, the, the things that, that uh, prevent that. I mean, I think there'd be all kinds of people if they could do it, if they were, you know, could they follow their uh, feeling to experiment with that, to, to try something. But, uh, you know, there's millions of layers of problems in the way. I mean, you, you've got to get permits to have, you have to have certain kinds of modern systems in a lot of places, you know, uh, or you go somewhere and it's, you don't have the money to, to have some land to, to be outside of the system insofar as you can be anymore. But, you know, I mean, there's just a million practical problems. So, uh, we'd see a lot more of it if there weren't, but, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we just have to see how many people might get fed up and want significant changes in that direction. Not, I don't think probably anything can happen overnight. Like, everybody's going to go, wow, suddenly it just ripples across the planet and everybody decides factories are not the answer, they're the problem, and all these other related uh, propositions, they, you know, it's they they are dependent on these factories for a for a livelihood you know and so forth i mean it's not it's not just some thing in the abstract that we could just go ahead and do so hmm. the question of a contingency plan is fraught with all of these obstacles it just is so but it's going to take i i think it's going to take some number of people uh making the demands on the existing society so that there can be a space for that somehow. And, you know, frankly, I don't know how that works. I, I just don't, I haven't even thought about that too much. I mean, we got, we, there's a, prior to that, there's more of a question of, of having these discussions, you know, having these debates, mm -hmm. trying to persuade people that transhumanism is not the answer. Sure, <laughs> for sure. example, you know, okay. before we have a roadmap to, uh, set up uh but yeah but you know your question is quite valid i think it's just a very difficult one say we had like um you know a good uh million people who wanted to live in a um a primitivist lifestyle and we had the resources to allow that to happen okay and i think we we would especially moving forward into the future because resource acquisition is going to get cheaper and cheaper um, and the footprint on the planet is going to get less and less if we drive technology in the correct way, which in some ways I okay. see happening. But anyway, that besides the point, um, would it take form of something like a like a primitivist reserve, like similar to reserves that we have today, wildlife reserves, not zoos? Okay, we're talking about reserves here where, you know, they're nobody allowed to build houses or, you know, build, like, factories or have, like, pipes or any form of infrastructure in. Like, wildlife reserves that exist in America and Australia and around the world. Could we develop, Could it, would it be possible to develop a reserve for primitivists? Well, I don't know. That's, uh, I suppose that's conceivable. But the real, the picture, I mean, you, you mentioned very much in passing, the footprint is getting lessened. I think it's exactly the opposite. There's less and less place to go. You can flee from civilization, but it's it's uh, it's more and more impossible. The, the thing has to be stopped for there to be the possibility you mentioned in some form or another. Otherwise, it's just completely out of the question. It's just, it would just be fantasy. You, It's... Uh, when you can't breathe the air, uh, you know, I mean, uh, well, you, you, there's no exalted privileged position for primitivists just like anybody else. There, there's, no, there's no escape from it. I mean, you, it's just, it really is killing everything. And the more technology there is, the worse it gets, period. It's not, it's not getting better. 
if it were getting better, we could look at the record together, you and I, and say, well, look at this. This is, this is, uh, this is the upside. We need more technology and more industry, and then we'll, we'll make even more progress. Well, where's the progress? What, what kind of uh, overall, I mean, it's just scandalous, and people know it. People really, I think there's so much anxiety because it is visibly, starkly getting worse. It's just, you know, the islands are sinking, and the, you know, the storms are getting worse. And, just, you know, there's 50 things that we could just reel off without even thinking about it that all are getting worse. These are severe problems. And then the and the technology is because of what fuels it. What fuels it is destroying the biosphere. I mean, it's just, you know, only these pinhead right wingers don't see that. They just say, oh, it's just mm -hmm. a plot by the lefties or something. Mm -hmm. Well, we're not lefties. We're not, we're past that stuff. We're not left or right. We're trying to, you know what I mean? It's, Anyway, I'm rambling here, but no, no, that, I just that's interesting. Don't see. You, you, you do have a left background. You used to um, be on some labor organization. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah you used oh, to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I did. I, just, I came from the left, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to just give us a brief background there and how you, well, you it, think you that know, may have influenced your thinking? Sure. Slowly, uh, yeah, I, I went through a different uh, you know number of phases beginning in the 60s, the movement of the 60s, you know, there was a, the movement for liberation in, in many, many countries, and uh, that was very decisive for me. But thinking about it afterwards, a number of us were thinking, well, why did it stop? And, you know, what were we not thinking about? And then later, and I wasn't aware of it at, at the time at all, but the question of technology was very, some people saw it early on, like Stuart Brand, you know Stuart Brand, the whole Earth Catalog guy, the American yeah, I know. guy? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, his, well, he, he phrased it very simply. <laughs> he said, the tech, it's technology, yes or no? And he said yes. He was an early transhumanist, right, mm -hmm. in some way. Well, uh, most of us weren't thinking about it either way. Mm -hmm. That really wasn't uh, on offer. It wasn't really the issue. Well, now it is. Now it's an inescapable. And it took me a while to... Uh, my my union days kind of there was a transition into studying early union movements which which kind of morphed into studying early industrialism mainly in england uh and and that then i began to you know run into these questions about technology maybe it it always has these values embedded in it no matter what technology is you can always see what society is really all about by looking at the technology again, before you get to the question of what do you do with it. And so, anyway, it led to these things, and the question of civilization and domestication came along, but it was years of stuff that one thing led to another. But yeah, way back, I was a union organizer and a union or, uh, officer in San Francisco way back when, and uh, now I'm rather anti-left because I think they embrace the whole uh, sphere of, of techno modernity as much as anyone else. So, you know, like Noam Chomsky, he's fine with it. He says, well, we got seven billion people to feed. You can't be talking about some primitivist stuff. And our question to him is, why are there seven billion people? What drives all this? You know, getting back to domestication and industrialization, that's what's driving this madness forward. Institutions like that, but he takes them for granted. And so, uh, He's, he's no ally of mine. Mm -hmm. He wants more of this. Like, you know, in, I don't think he knows much about transhumanism, I wouldn't think, but he, would, he probably would have no problem with the way you guys see it. I think, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure either. Yeah, I'm not, not sure exactly what he thinks about transhumanism. Um, although I have heard him say that he thinks that uh, strong artificial intelligence, that is um, a very powerful uh, sort of self thinking agent made from technology is ridiculous in the next well given in the next 100 years he thinks that it's probably not feasible to think about um, but oh, really yeah what's your what is your view then how, how do you picture how, how do you de how would you describe a a primitivist lifestyle that we could move into forget about like you know how to get there but what is the object what what level of technology would you accept and what would what would you not accept 
how would society work? Well, you know, this may seem like an odd intro to answering your question, but for 15 years I lived in a housing co-op here in Eugene, hmm. Oregon, and I didn't realize it at the time, but and it was, I think it was 22 households, and it was self-managed. It was, you know, run by those of us who lived there, uh, deciding what we needed to do, what work we did, we did, and so forth. And uh, later, it, it struck me, I mean, of course, within the dominant society, of course, I mean, we didn't live outside of it. We had, we had mortgage, a big mortgage to pay off and all the rest of it, but you know, in terms of the everyday thing, and I think this, to me, this is the most important aspect. Does the individual feel that they actually have a voice in how they live and how they interact? And I'm not saying that the co that the housing co-op was under gatherer society, you know, you get me there, but, uh, but that it, in a way it, it could make you think about this, this is a sort of alternative or at least conceivably an alternative and it actually was an alternative for you know for thousands of generations where these banned societies were just uh you know 60 80 people we, we talked about that a little bit before Kibbutz. and so yeah. their world is a tiny number of people they're not concerned about uh how you run the world they're con they're concerned with the quality of their own society you know that's so i mean that's like, if that's the fundamental thing, and if you lose that, once you start delegating your own autonomy and your own uh, choices to experts and politicians and so forth, you see where that goes to the condition now where people just don't have control over anything, and, and it's not a healthy situation. So I think ultimately I could at least fantasize that the the final, or no, it wouldn't be final, but the, the kind of goal, some something of a sort of an ultimate direction would be to get back to that kind of directness and immediacy. And I think only then do you really have the possibility of some kind of wholeness. We're interacting and, and we, we're, we're making these decisions with each other and, and they count. And if you don't have that, well, you just get by. We try to, we all do what we can, what we, where we look for pleasure and authenticity within the modern world. Of course we do. Lots of different things to uh, think about and distract us and everything else. But I mean, that would be the direction to go in. That would be some kind of the definition, or I mean destination, if you will, to be in that kind of condition in a rough way. I'm not saying it would be exactly like hunter-gatherer society used to be, whatever that is, we don't even know exactly what that was, you know, forager society. We know something, but it would be way more like that than, than what we have now. Okay. Do you think it's, I mean, how much can we know about what it was like to live beyond, like, you know, before we started recording things, uh, but before agrarian civilization, you know, accounting started? But I mean, I, th I still think that there's value in researching more anthropology uh, focus on what it was like to live 40,000 years ago. I mean, I think sure. that's interesting. Even if, it, oh, even yeah. if I don't want to live like that, I'd still right. be interested in finding out what it was like. Definitely, um, yeah, um, yeah. There's a lot we don't know. But there is some physical evidence. There's a lot of sure. physical evidence of egalitarianism. If, you know, again, the hearth sites or these camps... It, it isn't real hard to, to detect whether somebody's in charge and they got a lot of goods, a lot of stuff, and the others don't. I mean, that's that's just simple archaeology. I mean, again, you're not there. You don't you don't get to read anything. Obviously, there's no writing. Uh, we don't even know if there was language. I mean, there probably was, but maybe not. You know. So, well, but that's be that's trade. the kind of thing that kind of. In, 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 if you're looking at thousands and thousands of cases in many places, you get a rough idea of, of there's equality just because of physical stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and conversely, it's easy to see when there's not equality, when you've got hierarchy, when there's a big man in charge or a chief or whatever who's, who really is got the power.
he's got the artifacts of power. He's got the symbolic, you know, or, or not even symbolic, but it becomes symbolic at a certain point, and then it leads, I think, to to the actual trappings of power and hierarchy and stratification that comes in, and you can see it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't tell you everything, but it tells you some things that are pretty that are pretty clear. So, doing this sort of research gives you insights to the the primitivist tribes that seem like the ideal, and the ones that weren't ideal, the ones that were not as um, friendly or not as like a yeah. So like ones that had like a hierarchy or ones that had um, some form of authority that was un- that, that distributed resources unfairly between its denizens. Well, it, yeah, but in keeping in mind that it is roughly a progression, uh, in other words, band society precedes tribalism, and it's band society that I'm mainly referring to. Oh, and again, right. very importantly, domestication. If If before you have domestication, uh, in so many ways, things are, you know, they've got some pretty good solutions to things, and they've got the conditions are very different than time after time after time. And when the domestication thing comes in, it seems to just change everything. That's then that's when you get some stuff that we can all agree are probably not very good. Human sacrifice, yeah. l- lots of things that when you say primitive, uh, some people, you know, you could just think of things like that. Oh, I don't want to live okay, like that. But that's after domestication, okay? And we can flesh that out, but that's yes, my main... Yes, point. definitely. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to know the difference then between tribalism and banned society. Um, and, you know, what kinds of technology could be um, compatible with banned society, for instance? Well, that was a very, uh, very basic uh, uh, tool... Uh, plateau, if you will, that was uh, seemingly operative, or uh, they, they, that's what they did for really for way over a million years. So, uh, and we don't know their thinking. I mean, they didn't, did they sit down and say, we don't want to go past this because things might go south? I mean, uh, who knows? They probably didn't put it that way, but yeah, it's, uh, it's it's there are these changes and tribalism by the way in in some places at least was a response to contact a response to forces outside of banned society such that they needed to form they needed to adopt another level of organization where bands uh, give some power to a, a tribal level mm. in in uh, in support of the idea that that would give them more strength to resist invaders, you know, to resist colonizers and so forth. I mean, some sometimes it's roughly that simple. I mean, so then you you can see the logic that then they feel they combine and and uh, but then you know these are things that tend to lead down this path that you know toward more. Uh, more uh, stratification and so forth, more uh, a movement away from egalitarianism. Then you have some uh, hierarchies in practice. Sometimes they're only temporary, but sometimes they are they become permanent. And you know that's that's all. These stories are a little bit different depending on where you're talking about. Hmm. So how far can we go back and have a look at the first uh, beginnings of tribal society start? I mean, did it was that like would you class tribalism as have uh, as something that could have existed forty thousand years or beyond? Well, I don't think so. I, I don't think there's any evidence for that. Uh, I think that's because that's pretty much well. It's well before domestication, for one thing, and you you don't see some of these developments. They don't seem to be entering the picture. So uh, I think that's that would be, it wouldn't be that far back, but that's that's only a rough answer. And again, this varies, you know, from uh, different places, have different histories. Well, I mean, it seems like one of the reasons for um, uh, sort of for- foragers or hunter-gatherers forming tribal societies was to protect borders. But why would the first tribal society do such if, 
you know, there wasn't any threats from other tribes? Well, there were threats from, uh, in, say, North America, people coming in and uh, finding out that it's, uh, they're going to lose out if, uh, you know, if, if they uh, succeed militarily. I mean, you know, something as crude as that, it's, that's a story over and over again. Mm. Yeah. That's interesting. So, I mean, yeah, l l if we did uh, achieve some form of primitivist society, I'm just wondering how we'd maintain an equilibrium, w how we'd stop tribal societies from booting up and then, you know, getting more industrious and developing technologies for survival that to out-compete neighbours and uh, to out... Yeah. Well, you know, one thing to keep in mind here, and I think... Uh, Stanley Diamond, I can just mention him as one source that comes to mind. There really was uh, a huge resistance, and I'm generalizing here to a very large degree, but uh, it wasn't that pe people thought, well, let's, let's switch over to farming and private property and fences and borders and kings and everything else. We, there was really a lot, that, and this is somewhat overlooked in the literature, Maybe it's because uh, you know the victors always write the history. It's what you you what gets diminished is the record of people who in fact did lose. I mean they lost that struggle. It's domestication won, obviously. So, but there was he he stresses the fact that it was a bloody battle. It was a titanic. I think he uses that word struggle. That people didn't want that. They wanted their freedom and they didn't want to settle down and and. Uh, give authority to people that distributed the surplus and you know that's a whole it's the story of unfolding domestication and civilization right on the heels of domestication the first civilizations relatively speaking you know come in pretty fast once you have uh, domestication in place once it's victorious then the earliest civilizations pop up after so long. I mean, it, relatively speaking, I'm talking about, you know, if we're talking about a couple of million years ago when Homo erectus uh, had none of that, and then how fast it changes in the span of, if we're just talking about a few thousand years, thousands of years, that's a long time to us, but relatively speaking, it's not very, you know what I mean, in the whole picture of human species. Mm. Yeah, well, so I'm just wondering, like, I mean, there are some forms of domestication which seem relatively benign, like, you know, the uh, ancestors' ability to d domesticate dogs and things like that. What, what forms of domestication um, do you think are compatible with primitivism, but what forms of domestication exactly are the, the, the forms which you would not like to see if we did manage to go back to primitivism? Well, I could be wrong here, but I... I think that the only benign one was the case of dogs, and I'm, I'm not, and I'm just talking about the literature, the anthropological literature, that, that it seems to be the consensus is that that was a kind of mutual domestication, if you will, that that was a coming together on the part of both species, which is so different from... Uh, the other examples where you've got to tame the species, you, you've got to get physical control and really put the uh, put the hammer down to create a docile, uh, a qualitatively different form of the species. That that was different with dogs. Hmm. So it's uh, yeah, that that was a case. Apparently, there, there doesn't seem to be much dispute about that. That it was a co project, if you will, that there was, it wasn't like uh, cattle or, uh, or or so many other things where, uh, you know, horses or what have you, it, no, it was, uh, they were interested in humans and humans were interested in what dogs could provide, uh, a camp, you know, getting rid of garbage or telling them if there were predatory animals coming nearby or, well, you know, the, the things that we know about. From yeah. surviving uh, people's, and uh, it wasn't it wasn't so one-sided. Hmm. So, so I guess like if you were to draw a picture of um, a primitivist society, 
that would be attractive to people um, as an alternative to a technological society, how would you draw that? How would you describe it? Like, um, just to drill down further into what a primitive society would, like, what the alternative looks like. Well, I think, uh, I guess I'd say, first off, it's mainly a contrast with what we have now. In other words, it's not going to happen unless that contrast is a favorable one. And, uh, you know, like I said before, it may not happen. It may not prove to be attractive to people, but I see people... And, and the movie Her brought that out a little bit as well. Not <laughs> It wasn't movie. the main focus of the movie. But, you know, people here, just just staring at their device, they, they just don't seem to even notice the earth anymore. They're just stumbling along like zombies. And I'm thinking, is that going to hold up? Are they going to be so addicted to staring at a little screen all the time and then going to work and staring at a screen and going home for their entertainment, staring at a screen? Well, maybe, but I sort of doubt it. I don't think that's very fascinating. I don't think that's very exciting or uh, you name it. I mean, I think it's extremely limited. It is it is a novelty and people, a lot of people love it, apparently. I don't know how or why, but in other words, that's the option. Here, The option is already here. And if you don't like that, maybe you start to notice uh, the rest of creation and you know i mean and do something that isn't online you know you see these little flurries too right adam you see people saying i'm quitting facebook i'm gonna hang up my uh i'm not gonna look at my email account for a while you know in other words some people are already kind of chafing they're not totally mesmerized or fascinated by it you know even though it's become more and more pervasive right it's just ubiquitous but I could easily imagine people just getting tired of it and looking around for some better uh, way of interacting instead mm -hmm. of exchanging trivia every two seconds on your phone uh, <laughs> where you're not even interested in the place you are. A poet friend of mine said, it's like connecting nowhere to nowhere. And that's the sad truth of it. Look look what we've done with uh, with this planet. It's just getting standardized and uglified. I mean, I just... It's, so in a way, it's little wonder people don't want to look up from their phones because it's getting ruined in, in, in a lot of ways. I mean, fortunately, it's not total. I mean, it's this is very nice here in Eugene, Oregon in a lot of ways, and maybe it's very nice where you live. But you know what I mean. In general, it's not a pretty picture. I don't think it is. So if you, if you just want to go along with it, then, well, that's the future. So, I mean... Have you heard of uh, the Venus Project and um, the the ideals to try and merge sort of a lot of the the benefits of having you know trees, nature, and the beauty of nature sort of merged in with the comforts of technology? Um, have you ever heard of that? No, oh, I've, okay. I've heard of things like that. Yeah, where they're they're that's the promise of it. Well, we can. We can meld them together, and you'll have green spaces, but you'll also have all the conveniences. Well, it sounds good, but again, that's just uh, it sounds like a PR thing. Where, in fact, does it actually work? It's you're taking away the the unbuilt world uh, at a rather dizzying speed, right? I mean, that's the reality. It would be, you know, it would be nice to believe the other thing, but that's not the record. That's not uh, that's not what it's actually happening. Well, it seems as though there are attempts to in, in in sort of parts of the world to do such things, but I'm not making that out to be the global sort of uh, mind space. I think that there's plenty of places in the world that just want to, uh, you know, pull themselves out of poverty through industrialization, through you know, um, building massive cities and all those sorts of things, without much care for aesthetics and you know, getting back to nature. That's that's true. But there are some examples around where they're, they're trying to meld uh, the the ideals of technology um, to make it compatible with, you know, some of the, the beauties of nature, uh, you know, without having carnivores and predators around corners to, you know, take little children, of course, but, you know, like... Um, well, yeah, and there are places like that. I would freely admit, I remember uh, I was in Turkey once at a conference and uh, I, I gave a talk and then this fellow from Denmark, said, 
Well, I think you're way overdoing it. We don't have these industrial, uh, we, do, we don't have any of that. We don't have the factories. And uh, I'm not a real expert on Europe, but I was mentioning the Ruhr Valley in Germany, just south, just a little way south of Denmark. Hmm. It's, it's one of the most massively industrialized places on earth. Hmm. In other words, maybe it's not in little Denmark. I wouldn't know, but taking his word for it. Yeah, it's not everywhere, but it's somewhere. And if it's and it's got to be somewhere, maybe off stage a little bit where you don't really see it, but it's got to be there. The, the technology, for one thing, takes more and more power all the time. The more you have, and that power comes from somewhere, and all these metals and rare earths and all the rest of it, you know, it doesn't fall down from the heavens. It's uh, <laughs> it's manufactured, and mm. all the rest of it. We well, don't. The, the it, rare earth metals are, are you know, are just a basic commodity that you dig out of the earth these days but imagine a world if we had well it's it's radioactive out. often the yeah. rarest metal it's not just clean either it's no. anything but clean yeah. there are wars fought over these things you know it's anyway that's that's part of the present world of course okay well i mean okay so let's take an extreme thought experiment let's just say imagine we stumbled across a very advanced alien civilization that had abolished um, all forms of like you know the the negative effects of technology. They they'd abolished disease, unplanned pleasant experiences, aging, um, and they were super intelligent. They lived extremely long lives. And they were super happy, and the in, the inhabitants enjoyed like lives animated by gradients of lifelong bliss. What arguments would you, if you could, give them? to reintroduce, uh, you know, suffering, predation, parasitism, and the miseries of what they would describe as miseries as of their ancestral path. How would you, how would you convince them to go back to primitivism if they uh, gotten well, over all the problems associated with it? it? Yeah, that's, well, that's an ideal situation. It's, uh, it's a nice fantasy, but there isn't any reason to think that that's conceivable given at least we know where these things come from like i just said we we know the massive industrialization that's required for technology to exist before we even get on to these other questions of how you use it and stuff and we know what it's doing to the planet so i mean you can you could posit such a world uh, alien civilization or something but it seems uh it's kind of pointless if, if it has nothing to do with the reality we're talking about. We're trying to deal with this, this world and where it's going and what it's doing, uh, you know, from the, in terms of psychology, all the way out to the, you know, the, the, uh, what the cost is to the physical environment. But it's a all of these things. It's I don't. I don't know if any of these things, if if any part of it is healthy. I, I really don't. That's why, no. I, unless you see, unless maybe somebody will invent that, right? It's somehow a, a perpetual motion machine or whatever. I mean, but uh, none of it has worked so far. And and actually, I don't know if Chomsky's right about AI, strong AI, mm -hmm. but. I don't think he uh, And it, maybe I'm not the one to carry the banner of uh, the critique of these things either. I, I don't know as much about it as you do. I'm certain of that. But, you know, and where is the, what would be the connection between that alien uh, perfect reality and, and the one that we're actually having to submit to now for, for the transhumanist ideals to be put forth? Well, that's, I think with the thought experiment, that's taken off stage to isolate just whether um, there is a desirability to, uh, to live in this, you know, this hypo hypothetic alien state. If there is a desire to live like that, that that's in its own should be recognized as a point um, of contention or a point of agreement, I don't know. So if it were possible and these guys were living like super meaningful, flourishing, happy, unsuffering, beautiful lives, uh, incredibly technologically advanced, they've solved the resource problem and, and you know, they were being incredibly efficient about how they harvested and produced any resources that they needed. 
um, then you know what would be the problem? I'm not saying that it's that it definitely is possible. I'm trying to take off stage yeah. how to get there, but just the thought of if it's well, yeah, if, no, no, that sounds. Uh, if you if you paint that picture, uh, you, you know, and we could fill in the other parts of it too. You could say um, the humanism part of transhumanism doesn't seem to notice other species i mean i don't know if that's totally true but you didn't mention other species are they well, equally just, happy or have they disappeared or, or what well my my hope is that any sentient life form uh within this hypothetical experiment would be along for the ride um, oh, yeah right. so it's it's not just like one particular species that had just you know uh at, at one stage clicked his fingers and wiped everything out but yeah david yeah. pierce i mean I think you'd agree on on many levels with David Pierce, except the hows. <laughs> um, but anyway, mm -hmm. he, he's all for like a the, you know uh, like a, having a lot of respect for sentient life and and not and, and uh, reducing suffering of all sentient life, not factory farming and not all the not using animals as like a you know I guess in a factory setting in order to achieve goods. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping, hopeful that we as a human civilization can uh, achieve that, but that's beside the point of the thought experiment, whether we can do it. But if yeah. an alien civilization worked out how to do it, um, would that be desirable? Would you still argue that they should go back to primitivism? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't see... It sounds like... Uh, that's that somehow domestication doesn't exist and uh it isn't a control i mean it sounds it sounds very good frankly but we and we don't know we don't really know what makes people tick right i mean to, in other words what are the what satisfies people what they they need what do they need they need a project or do they only need a project when they're having to contend with a sort of alien context in other words i think about that for myself i've basically you could say i've spent my whole life working on the question of alienation what if there wasn't any alienation i'd be out of a job <laughs> i mean i don't get paid for it anyway but you know what i'm saying i'm sure you'd find well, other things you know that are, yeah, that are totally would. enriching right? but i'd like to be out of a job i don't, I don't want to have to <laughs> you know we struggle with these problems only because they exist not because it's some I mean, there's no other reason to do it, right? It's just that, it you know, it just opens up all these questions. How do we get here, and what do we really want? And so, your this alien existence, presumably, they've solved. They they maybe they don't think in those terms anymore. They they don't. I mean, I remember reading. This maybe I hope this isn't too much off the subject, but industrial society and its future by Theodore Kaczynski. He, it oh, yeah. starts out, he's talking about how if you only have surrogate activities, you're not going to be happy. You know, the, in other words, when people, if you had a technological society where people could just have hobbies, maybe jumping off from there, wouldn't even need to do all this work and so forth. He's saying that wouldn't be satisfying. It would just, it would just be some kind of artificial uh, work that you're doing. It wouldn't really be something that has value. It wouldn't be needed. I mean, I don't think he's against hobbies, but he was kind of saying that comes to the fore when you're not really allowed to have a meaningful life. And anyway, he goes on to other things, and he also argues that you don't have freedom either. You give up authenticity and freedom in industrial society, and he, he meant technological society too, of course. And uh, are you familiar with that work? Do you, you, I, uh, I, I'm familiar with Ted, Ka Ted Ka oh, I can't say his name. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Kaczynski. Ted Kaczynski, that's right. Yeah. Um, I, I've read the, the name, but the pronunciation that I've read is different from the way that you say it. And I'm, <laughs> so, uh -huh. yeah, I think uh, his, his work is interesting. Um, and I know you've written quite a bit about his critique uh, but you don't agree with his ends, I don't believe. Um, yeah, so yeah, we've we've had our differences, mm, and yeah. uh, I mean that's uh, he's he's talking about what is satisfying. I mean, in a way, that's more of a work of psychology 
than anything yeah, else. He's that talking about for the human condition. It's interesting, um, and that's a, a debate which goes on. I think, though, like if we were transhuman and we could engineer ourselves to find meaning and freedom, as you describe it, I'm not sure what you mean by freedom. Okay, um, people have a different concept of that. Some people think that free will does not actually exist. Uh, that we're really just like a playing out of metaphysical functions from the the Big Bang or you know some sort mm -hmm. of big wave theory. Okay, that aside, I, I think it's unproductive to get into that. But like, so yeah, can flourish without you know negative stimulus. They don't need to be frightened for their life in order to have meaning in life. They don't need to be chased by you a like a you know a lion in order to have meaning in life. They don't need to. Um, you know, have an argument with their boss to have meaning in life, or have you know, it could be mm -hmm. just all all stimulus could be positive. Um, everything, all, all our our stimulus could be just on some kaleidoscope of positive hedonistic experience. If you know what I mean. So yeah. Oh yeah, that's, we that's, don't know uh, enough, but we could engineer ourselves. To, to yeah, know. it's it's conceivable. It's it's uh, stimulating to think about these mm. things. I I try to, if if anarcho primitivism isn't uh, completely fringy or bizarre, it really does rest on an analysis of what we have now and where it's going and why why it's arrived. You know that I think it contributes something there, and it's yeah. probably. I mean, if there is a value, and I think there is, that's where it really resides mm -hmm. in terms of looking at the options and looking at the directions we're going in and are there grounds for going along with transhumanism or not, for example. I mean, you know, it, it rests on, and, and it draws on anthropological, ethnographic stuff, uh, if you like. I mean, that's it doesn't depend upon that, but it, I think we can try to avoid the traps of ideology if we are grounded as much as we can and we all have our own you know conclusions which are almost unavoidably ideological but if we if we can focus on on the current reality uh, in all of its layers and, and you know all of its uh, depth then then uh, maybe we can maybe the conversation you know gets enriched if it mm. because otherwise it's just I'm I'm peddling this ideology. You're peddling that ideology. I mean that doesn't go very far, right? You know, it's just we we've got to find where we can focus. Hmm. I mean that's not all of it, of course, but I think that's I like to think of that as pretty central, and that we have more questions than answers. And if we if we stick to the questions more than trying to pass out the like we have all the answers, then maybe we'll be in a healthier place for the dialogue. Yeah, sure. Actually, that 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 sounds productive. Um, and so, you know, people have different opinions about. Oh, often, people cartoon like other ideologies that they don't hold close to their heart, and it's a problem. But yeah. it's, it's, I think it's I think it's you know quite endemic. It just happens everywhere all the time. But you know, I mean, sure. I'll, and that's why I say I think there are some similarities between the values. Uh, that that some primitivists may hold, like you know the, the the want for a happier life, the want for people to be able to flourish and and uh, you know main, maintain an existence where they're you know they they have meaningful, flourishing, happy lives and at a fundamental level. That's what most transhumanists want as well. They don't want to see people suffer. They they don't want to they don't want to see animals suffer. Um, and this is with, which is quite striking about some of the particular th threads in tran transhumanism, like the hedonistic imperative, which is a about trying to achieve a like u the happiest experience, um, and then b the uh, the existential risk threads that like Nick Bostrom and Anders Sandberg and the, the guys at the Future of Humanity Institute are trying to really spend a lot of uh, resources and time on figuring out how to avoid like big problems with technology. Uh, and, and how to avoid uh, risk that could make not only us extinct, but uh, you know maybe the whole planet and all those sorts of things. So uh, risk, uh, risk of these sorts of things. So yeah, yeah. This yeah, I'm not, I'm not uh, mm. claiming bad faith. I think that we're just looking at the basics, mm. very different, or including 
certain basics or not including certain basics, which yeah. again may be the better ground for. But I'm I'm glad to hear that they're thinking of these things. I I wouldn't imagine that they're not. Hmm. I'm not saying that. You know, it's but uh, well, I've uh, I've got to get going, and I hope this is. I mean, maybe we could <clears throat> we should stop before uh, before I'm making less sense than I have been. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, it's been really good. I'm um, glad we got back together, Adam. Mm. And uh, I know this dialogue will go on, and uh, absolutely. And I guess in, in October mm. I'll be uh, you know talking with uh, Zoltan in down at Stanford University. Okay, I think that's pretty much set uh, last half of October, and yeah, that'll be uh, down there. And then there is the Humanity Plus program or some kind of event there as well in October. Is yeah, that right? I believe so. Yep. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I heard that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, at Stanford University. Um, so that that's definitely worth checking out. Um, yeah. yeah. The other thing is like you know, um, I'd be interested in holding an online sort of a panel on these subjects with some people who have expertise in different areas discussing this problem. And I think that'd be that'd be useful. Uh, sure. So, yeah. So. Okay. Uh, I could yeah, organize something like I'm that. I'm open to that. If you were thinking of me being yeah. included, I, uh, yeah, yeah, I'd yeah, like yeah. to follow that. If I'm not included. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, all right. Well, I'll, I'll follow up about that. Maybe I'll get a sociologist and and an AI guy to come and talk about that. Um, yeah. All right. I've always uh, I've always had a. Desire to visit Australia, so uh, yeah, man. I'm still if you ever come down, you know, you should to you be should able to out. visit sometime. And, I live uh, in Melbourne, so yeah, that's yeah, kind of yeah. Down. Well, good talking with you, Adam. We we have some disagreements, obviously, but uh, I, I I hope I started getting in a better place in the conversation, and I'm glad we stuck with it. I'm glad you stuck with it. Excellent, excellent. Oh, it's been really good. Yeah, hope to do it again sometime. Good. Yeah. Take care. Yeah. Bye.